Hi, I'm Mason Vale from Boise State University, and we're going to talk about analyzing algorithms for efficiency. Your primary responsibility as a programmer is to write correct code. If your code doesn't do what it's supposed to do, nothing else really matters. However, not every correct solution is created equal. Some solutions are more efficient than others, and we do need some way to determine how efficient a solution is and to compare the efficiency of alternative solutions. Now usually when we talk about efficiency, we're talking about how much work the computer's processor has to do, and that's what we're going to focus on here. You should know though that you can also analyze memory use, communication costs, and other things like that in the same way. Now this is also going to be a very high level look at algorithm analysis, so we're not going to be concerned with actual clock cycles to carry out instructions. We're simply going to count whole high level statements as written in Java code. Let's start with a real world example washing dishes by hand. Let's say it takes 5 minutes to fill the sink with hot soapy water, 30 seconds to wash and rinse a dish, and 30 seconds to dry a dish. It will take n minutes to wash and dry n dishes, plus the 5 minutes of preparing the sink. We would say the growth function for this algorithm, representing the amount of work it takes to wash and dry n dishes, is f of n equals n plus 5. But what if we used a different algorithm? In this case, it still takes 5 minutes to fill the sink with hot soapy water, 30 seconds to wash a dish or dry a dish, but we're now extremely sloppy, and every time we wash a dish, we slop water all over the stack of dry dishes. We're also not very smart, so after every dish, we re-dry the stack of wet dishes. It will take the same 5 minutes to prepare the sink and 30 seconds to wash each dish, but drying will now take the sum of 30 seconds for all i from 1 to n for a total growth function of 1 quarter n squared plus 3 quarters n plus 5. It's pretty obvious that our sloppy stupid algorithm is going to take longer than the careful smart algorithm, but how much more? Let's chart the growth of these two algorithms as n increases and we'll see. For one dish, both algorithms take 6 minutes. By 20 dishes though, the careful algorithm takes 25 minutes, while the sloppy algorithm takes 2 hours. For 50 dishes, the careful algorithm takes less than an hour, while the sloppy algorithm takes over 11 hours. And at 110 dishes, the careful algorithm is still under 2 hours, while the sloppy algorithm would take over 2 days. Clearly, it pays to be careful. Now, having precise growth functions is certainly the most accurate way to see how work is affected by the size of the problem, but it can get difficult to determine the exact growth function for non-trivial algorithms, and it turns out you don't need the exact growth function to make a meaningful comparison between algorithms. Let's look at how the factors in each growth function contribute to the total work as n grows. For both algorithms, the constant factor 5 represents 83% of the total work to wash a single dish, but as n increases, the 5 represents less and less of the total until it finally has a negligible impact. For our smart algorithm, f of n equals 5 plus n, the n factor quickly dominates the total. For our stupid algorithm, the 3 quarters n factor also drops toward insignificance as n increases, leaving the 1 quarter n squared factor dominating the total. As n becomes very large, it turns out the coefficients on factors also become less and less significant. Ultimately, we can categorize algorithms by the dominant factor of their growth functions alone. We call this the algorithm's order, and we represent it with big O notation. For f of n equals 5 plus n, then, we say the algorithm is order n, or has a big O of n. For f of n equals 5 plus 3 quarters n plus 1 quarter n squared, we say the algorithm is order n squared, or big O of n squared. In algorithms where work is affected by only one variable, like the size of a collection for example, common orders include big O1 or constant, big O log n or logarithmic, big O n or linear, big O n log n or log linear, big O n squared or quadratic, big O n cubed or cubic, and big O 2 to the n or exponential. The differences from one order to the next are dramatic, but any two growth functions with the same order will have similar growth curves and have more in common with other algorithms of the same order as n becomes very large than with algorithms of different orders, regardless of coefficients or any lesser factors. If you're choosing between algorithms and you know the problem size n may become very large, choosing an algorithm with the smallest order will have more impact on performance than any tweaks you could make to an algorithm with a worse order. 
let's look at characteristic plots of the different orders to see how they compare. Though not shown here, any constant number of statements in an algorithm that's not affected by changes in n will eventually be exceeded by an algorithm that requires more work as n increases. Constant or big O1 algorithms then are considered more efficient as n becomes large than any algorithm that's dependent on n. The slowest growing order shown here is logarithmic or big O log n. In general, we say that the size of n has to double to add one additional statement to the work done by a logarithmic algorithm. Linear, or big O n algorithms, grow in direct proportion to n. Code for these algorithms often contain a single loop with iterations dependent on n, or include recursive calls that depend on n. Log linear algorithms grow with the product of n and log n, resulting in a very gentle upward curve. Quadratic algorithms increase with the square of n and produce this familiar distinct curve. Code for these algorithms is characterized by a pair of nested loops, where each loop's iterations depend on n. Additional levels of loop nesting creates higher orders. Three levels of loop nesting, where each loop depends on n, results in a big O n cubed cubic algorithm, which is clearly worse than quadratic. No exponent on n, however, will result in worse performance than the big O 2 to the n exponential growth shown here. Exponential algorithms, such as might result from examining every combination or permutation of a sequence like a string of bits or characters, results in exponential growth that quickly becomes infeasible to process for even the most powerful computers in existence. When n is 64, an exponential algorithm would require about a month's processing time on a supercomputer, and when n is 128, the number of statements would be about 10 to the 12th times greater than the age of the universe in nanoseconds. In other words, if you want to solve that problem, you're going to need a different algorithm. When you see these curves together, it's especially obvious that the worst of the orders are worth working hard to avoid, but any time you can find an algorithm that has a better order than its alternatives, it will pay off in reduced processing time. As an example of determining the order of some actual code, let's look at a method that counts the occurrences of a particular character in a string. There's a loop in this method that iterates through each of the characters in the string. The length of the string, then, affects the number of iterations, and is n for this method. We would say that the loop itself will be big O of n. We need to look inside the loop now to see if there are any nested loops also dependent on n, or any methods with loops dependent on n. Inside the loop, there is a call to the string's charat method, which can directly look up a character by index, so that's a constant time operation. The condition check is one statement, also constant. Our worst case scenario is that the condition is always true, and so we always increment count. But even so, there's nothing taking place inside the loop that depends on the length of the string. So the total order of the method is big O n. For this example, we're analyzing the sort string method. Again, we have a loop that depends on the length of the string passed in. So string length is again our n for this algorithm. The loop itself is big O of n, but we need to examine code inside the loop to see if there's anything there that also depends on n. The call to method find low takes an array of the string's characters and iterates over a subset of all of those characters, starting with the index passed in. Even though it's a subset of all characters, the total number of characters is still n, and more characters will result in more iterations of the loop in find low. Find low is therefore itself a big O of n algorithm. A big O n algorithm inside a big O n loop makes sort string a big O n squared algorithm. The second method call inside sort strings loop is the swap method that always executes three statements. It's not affected by the length of the string, so it only adds a constant number of statements to the loop. The total order of the sort string method then is still big O n squared. This example illustrates that even though we didn't see an obvious nested loop in the sort string method, we still had another big O n loop inside the find low method, and that caused the sort string method to be big O n squared. You'll find that data structures in real world applications may hold not just dozens or hundreds of elements as shown in most of these examples, but thousands, millions, and potentially even billions of elements. This makes efficient algorithms for adding and removing elements or searching and sorting elements extremely important. So, good luck and good analyzing.